What's up, everybody? I'm here with Cinevino. My name is Wesley Marsh. I'm here speaking with Mike Plant, the senior shorts programmer for the Sundance Film Festival. My name is Mike Plant. I'm a senior pro programmer for short films at the Sundance Film Festival, and I've worked here since 2001. Very good. So that's uh, the early 2000s when we started. So basically 20 years now at this point, right? Don't remind so. me. <laughs> yeah, I think this is... I always have to redo the math. I guess this is my 21st festival. Very good. So you started with three programmers for the shorts and now you're, I think up to eight. Is that true? Yeah, yeah this year it's nine. Um, eight of us watch the submissions and then Heidi Zwicker also watches features. So she comes in later um, and does both. So yeah, nine of us pick the film that play the festival. So how many films were submitted this year? And how many were uh, selected? A little over 10,300 were submitted, which seems ridiculous. I should send you a screenshot. It really did happen. <laughs> and um, But we take six months to watch them, so we do get through them all. And normally, we're, we have, you know, I guess, the, the freedom to show up to 80 shorts. You get you get an honorarium if you get in, so it basically comes down to a budget number. So so we cap it at eighty. We usually show between seventy and eighty, depending on their run times. This year, because of the pandemic, we were a little bit smaller. We did fifty nine shorts this year, but hopefully next year we'll be back up to seventy five or so. Okay, it's pretty good. Still a lot of shorts, a lot of different uh, ones to choose from. So after last year's festival and going into this one. How did the programming team alter how they went about selecting films or the criteria for the short films? Not at all. Um, you know, the good part about the process is our jobs to find good films and interesting filmmakers and show the movies. And we would love to do that in a movie theater, obviously, <laughs> but it didn't impact us too much other than the fact that we were showing less means just more great films. We just didn't have we never have room for all the great films we see. So unfortunately we showed less, but it didn't really impact what we did. We, we make a program and, you know, we try to find a film that's going to be the great anchor that'll show last, what kind of good short will show at the start, what's going to open it. And then we make each program do a little bit of a roller coaster ride. Um, so you'll have drama, comedy, um, you know, we do have a program, a couple programs that are only documentary, but same thing, you know, you want some heavy stuff and some light stuff. Some things may look super slick, like they cost a lot of money and other things cost less than a hundred bucks. You know, we like to show a lot of variety of what's being made. So we, we stuck with that, that even though we were showing less and eventually at the time we picked them, we thought we'd be in person. So then nothing would be in virtual really changed what we did, thankfully. Okay. So would you say that the pandemic influenced the styles of films that you watched this year? Not really. Of course, we have a lot more shorts that have something to do with the pandemic or COVID or isolation. Um, you usually see stuff that is influenced by what's going on in the world, though. So that didn't seem unusual. Um, I feel like some, just personally, I think, some genre films were hurt pretty bad. Some films that you might need a bigger crew on set for, that you might need special effects, bigger special effects and practicals. I feel like we saw less of that, which is too bad. I don't know if we even saw that many sci-fi things, you know, something that might need a big set that takes some people to construct it. I feel like that got impacted. Um, however, archive documentaries are thrilled by the pandemic because you can sit around and edit with all this footage that's already done. Um, so we saw a lot more of that. And, you know, we saw a lot of films, if anything, in, in a good way, I think we saw a lot of films, subjects and themes that were about just reassessing character situation. And, and it wasn't always about COVID at all. It was, it was more about like, you know, you see films now with two people, two main characters instead of seven. Um, and a lot of characters, even in documentaries are, had a positive spin where like, okay, this is, my life right now. This is what I'm forced to do every day. How can I make that more of my own? How can I have power over what's going on in my life? 
Um, and sometimes it was really heavy and other times it was, it was very light, just sort of what, what can you do in the everyday? So that was sort of nice. So I'm guessing that the pandemic might've influenced that. It might've influenced how I look at films though too. And I just see themes and stuff where it's not really there. <laughs> but, um, but we, we saw a lot of positive stuff that was, that was enlightening. It wasn't all uh, doom and gloom, not worse than usual. Yeah, I understand definitely. So tell me how the Sundance Shorts program aims to be an inclusive program for diverse forces in storytelling. Well, you know, part of our job has always been to find unheard voices. And right from the start, um, when Robert Redford started the labs and started the festival, uh, there's always been a, a focus on indigenous storytellers and movies and writers and, and everybody that works behind the scenes. And since then, you know, it's been, we've been lucky in the shorts program because we get so many films. There's, there's in general, there's less barriers to making a short film. A feature often costs more money, takes more people. And then you start getting into people who have to approve and give you permission for what you do. And that's where things get messed up in this industry. And with a short, I think some people do spend a lot of money, but for the most part, you can get it together to make a short without somebody's permission. So we see so many more diverse people in front of the camera, behind the camera, and, and it's really, we're lucky. Um, getting 10,000 films, we have more to choose from. When it gets down to it, there's still the same problem as always. There's more good films that we could possibly show. But for the most part, you start by like, what are the best films? What are the best stories? And you end up with a very diverse program and we double check ourselves at the end, like, okay, what, what are our numbers? What do we have here? And you know, who is telling these stories that we like? Is there someone else telling the story and it's the similar film, a similar story and is told a different way? And what's each filmmaker's connection to the story? We start looking at, at things like that as best we can with the information we have. And you, you make sure that you have a really diverse program. Um, you know, we're an American festival. We want people who are coming to the festival to see what America really is. And that's, that's a really diverse population, all kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of social um, stature um, just around America. And then we try to show a lot of stuff from around the world too. And, and you hope that you're seeing everything that's being made, <laughs> you know? Um, so part of it is that making sure that you, you've got the best and the diverse from what's being submitted. And then it's, it's difficult because it takes some time outside of our usual schedule, but then we make sure that we go to regions, especially in America, but also outside of the country and make sure people just know what we're doing. Um, I think a lot of part of it is, you know, you, they understand our rules. We have no, we have no world premiere status. We want to make sure that people you can show somewhere else and still show at Sundance. I think a lot of folks don't send their short to us because they're worried about that rule, but you know, we'll show something that's, if it's online. And then I think it's also just scary. Even before I worked here, you know, I came one year and it was really big. It's really expensive. <laughs> and, and you're like, well, I don't know if I can make something like this. And so we spend a lot of time, not just talking to film schools, but just going around to as many community centers as we can saying like, we want to hear your story. Um, don't feel like you have to be what Hollywood is representing for us to be interested in you. And, you know, just because certain things that are very mainstream make money, that's not necessarily what we're interested in. Tell us your small stories, tell us your regional diverse stories, and we want to try to help as much as possible. So we try to do that outreach too, as much as we can. Yeah, so that being said, how has the short film audience demographic changed in recent years? And how does the Sundance Shorts programming look to serve the filmmaker and connect them with the industry? I think the audience has gotten wider and diverse and just bigger because of the internet and um which is a good thing um it's a messy thing <laughs> trying to find something on on especially if it's, you're just searching for titles that are similar but you know i think the fact that people can see shorts easier now whether it's through paid websites paid streaming services or free websites the more people realize you can make a short film too and like hey maybe it, maybe my story you know all the indigenous shorts we show oh maybe i that's me too on screen i can also 
be making a short because this person made a short. And if you didn't come to the fest before, you couldn't, you might not know that. And maybe you didn't have a regional film festival that was good wherever you live and you didn't know that. And so the internet's helped that. And I think, you know, everybody's at least got 10, 15 minutes <laughs> to watch something. So I think the internet's really made the audience bigger. Um, for us serving the filmmaker in general, you know, our job is to put on a great event and have show the best films we can find, have a good program that has a lot of mix of styles and stories and voices. And um, if you come to the festival, you're gonna see really great stuff presented with great projection, great sound, and it's gonna be a fun event. So beyond that, all we can really do is we connect the industry with all the shorts we show. So, you know, I have about 300, 400, like true industry members that I'll send the shorts to that are with companies that are agents, managers, some producers that are looking for talent. Um, and then all the streaming websites um, from the New Yorker magazine to Netflix to Aeon magazine, you know, a lot of all different kinds of sizes. And often they'll pick stuff up, they'll license it. And then some websites are looking for talent to work with, obviously um, the big websites like, like Hulu sees all our shorts and they don't buy shorts, but they want people to work with. So you hope they make these connections. The best we can do is just tell everybody, hey, these films are really cool. <laughs> you should watch them. And you know, often it does help because sometimes they're looking for the storyteller, but also like, oh, I like how this was edited. I like how this was shot. And people can find jobs that way. Of course, actors, uh, it's great to be in a lot of shorts. Um, we see so many people do, still do shorts, even if they're in TV shows or they're in um, movies. Uh, Zachary Quinto is in a short this year. Uh, I, think, I think actors really just wanna work. So hopefully we, we can help. As long as the industry can see these films and understand these voices exist, we hope that then the connections can be made after that. So would you say that the industry demand for short films has changed in recent years? Yeah, probably the last, definitely the last decade because of the internet um, and in the last five years with all oh, the craziness that's going on like how many websites do I got to buy now see everything <laughs> it used to be like well, I grew up with video stores and you go to a video store anywhere you're like okay I can get all this stuff now it's like oh I want to watch this movie so I got to drive an hour because that one video store is the only one that's got that video taste <laughs> you know it's it's kind of nuts and I get it uh, the competition but uh, on the flip side, I hope, I think that's going to be good for short, short films and short filmmakers because if you want something good, you should be paying for it. This stuff, you know, you shouldn't be getting good movies for free if you're a very giant company <laughs> that's, that's charging people to watch them. You should pay for what the best is out there. So, so I think the demand, the demand has definitely gotten bigger because of that. Yeah, so do you think that the industry demand for short films influences how Sundance selects films that are submitted to show? No, nah, we couldn't care less. <laughs> and uh, I just don't care, I, I got a job either way. Uh, no, it's, we're lucky again, because this has been the standard, you know, I'm showing a short I think is great, or maybe I'm, we're showing a short that we think is difficult, but we think there's something to be said. We'll also show a short that's like, it's messy. Like, yeah, it probably should be two minutes shorter. Maybe the camera work's not perfect, but there's such, there's something about it. And usually it's in the, the meaning and, and what it's conveying to audiences. And it's not super slick and that's fine. We're gonna show that anyway. Um, and people come see it. That's our job. We're nonprofit, <laughs> it probably helps. And, um, and I don't know what any of these filmmakers really wanna do. Um, a lot of filmmakers we support teach for a living and then they tell the story they want to tell. They don't ask for permission to tell it. And other folks would like to jump right into commercials, jump right into features or streaming. And that's cool too. We can make that connection and hopefully it works out. So I, we're super lucky where people will come to see films we show. We have sponsorship so we can exist. And I, we hope the industry can interact with the people that we find as well, however they choose to do so. Tell us a little bit about the From the Collection anniversary shorts. Do you have a personal favorite from the collection? Uh, the anniversary shorts, it's, it's the 40th anniversary of the Sundance Institute, our summer labs. Um, and the festival started a few years after that. But we thought it was just a nice crossover. 
Um, especially because like we're saying the last 10 years, short film audiences have blown up and kind of figured out they existed, but we, I don't think people know that, you know, short films, that it was the first type of film made and it goes away for a little while and TV kind of becomes the version of short films for a while. And then it comes back in the, in the sixties and seventies with film schools and with film festivals that have been around ever since. So we thought it'd be a fun way to show, show the history of shorts. Also, it was just kind of hard to find a lot of old stuff because people don't have quick times. <laughs> they're, oh, they're short, even before like 2010. So they're like, oh man, okay, we'll try to help you get a transfer. Um, so it was great. And we did the same thing we always do. Like oh, it's so, so many great diverse voices, so many different styles. Um, I don't have any, you know, I like all of them, honestly. I'm not lying. I really like all of them. And uh, because we only had to do 40, it, it makes it good. The ones that come Come to pop in mind are Greetings from Africa by Cheryl Dunye, which is really funny, very small personal film from the late 90s. Like, I'll say the wrong year, but it's late 90s and really feels like a 90s film. Feels like, like you know, she is a filmmaker. She did all of this herself and it's her story and it's funny. That was a really great one. Um, from 2001, there was a short called The Subconscious Art of Graffiti Removal, which is about when graffiti gets painted over and over again, and it becomes sort of like a Rothko print. And so it's a documentary, but it's a fake documentary, but it's kind of real. <laughs> you know, This new art form that's made when cities cities have a secret agenda to make Rothko art over other people's graffiti. That was a really good one. Um, and then another one from the mid 2000s is uh, Solo and Cargador um, Porter. It's a, it's a really beautiful 16 millimeter portrait of a porter that carries luggage up and down Machu Picchu. Uh, made by this Peruvian filmmaker. Uh, just really, uh, I'm picking all films made on film, which is of course nostalgic. I don't think you have to make a film on film, but it's it's nice. It's interesting to see the different eras of that film, that filmmaking now. Okay, so quickly, tell us some advice you would give to filmmakers for submitting a short film. Uh, two things, D work from your backyard. Like what's a story you know inside and out that you can tell somebody in two minutes and entertain them? And it can be happy or sad. It can be real or fake. That's the story you should be telling. Don't jump on the bandwagon of whatever's popular. Um, you can always get work later because you made something good. But do something you know inside and out. And then also for the production, like literally, what's your backyard look like? We're showing the film that's great this year called Hallelujah. He had his backyard. He made it in his backyard and it looks nice. Do you have a friend who has a cool place? Do you have a friend who has a, a nice car? Do you have a friend who's a stand-up comedian and can remember lines and not mess up and do the same thing over and over again in front of a camera? That person should be your actor. So things like that, what's the backyard? And then um, nobody is waiting for any of us to make a film. Um, I make documentaries and no one's waiting for me to make another film, <laughs> nobody. People are even waiting for Redford to make another film anymore. So nobody cares what, unless you're one of like 10 people in Hollywood, nobody cares what you do. So that is great. You can mess up. You think something took what was gonna take one month, it took a year, fine. Who cares? Don't put, there's no pressure on you to make other people happy. Take the time you need, do what you wanna do. The short didn't work out, all right, make another short. Like you're, there's nothing, there's no wrong way to go about this. Like keep trying, keep failing, go at your own pace and do exactly what you want to do. And don't worry about other people's opinions. Excellent advice. So last question here. Tell me, what excites you the most about the future of short filmmaking and the Sundance Shorts program? I think really, not to keep harping on the internet, I hope most people see short films in a theater. But I'm just happy that people can see films easily, uh, see short films easily. It, it was such a mysterious, weird thing that you had to do in school and you had to prove you can make something so you can make something else. And I think it's become its own art form, the way someone's a poet and someone else writes a novel, um, the way somebody writes an opera and the way somebody else writes a two minute song. You know, short films finally being seen as its, as its particular art form and it's becoming easier and easier to watch it, whether in a theater or online. And, you know, even with it becoming a competitive space for how you find stuff, I just think it's, it's the best era ever for short films to be made and found. 
and seen and and that's really exciting even if i wasn't doing this gig <laughs> it's it's pretty exciting uh, uh, i'm pretty happy about where we're at for this very great mike this interview has been extremely enlightening and your work with the sundance shorts has been innumerable and great in pushing the genre forward and getting short films out there so more people can see and i just want to thank you for sitting down with us and giving us some of your time today for sure thanks so much i hope hope you get to see all the shorts we're showing i did check out some of them i did enjoy the ones that i saw but i do want to catch some more before you know the festival's over <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, it adds up. The time does add up when you watch a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you again. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. Nice talking to you. All right. You enjoy the rest of your day.